I will present on work titled Mesh Messaging in Large-Scale Protests, Breaking BridgeFi, done in collaboration with Martin Albrecht, Jorge Blasco, and Rega Jensen. The story begins with the Hong Kong anti-extradition law amendment bill protests that started in 2019. Organization of these large-scale protests has been described as mostly leaderless, and it made heavy use of various online platforms. So given this, there were fears that the government would use its emergency powers and block these platforms in order to prevent the protesters from communicating. In this setting, a number of articles reported on the apparent rise of messaging apps, which enable communication in the face of a potential internet shutdown by the government. And these reports focused on one app in particular, and this was BridgeFi. It allows people to communicate without internet using a mesh network that is composed of mobile devices um, connected to each other via Bluetooth. Now, BridgeFi was first conceived as an app for music concerts and sports stadiums, where mobile networks may become congested, but this is miles away from the potentially highly adversarial setting of a protest. However, the app was still being marketed as secure and end-to-end -end encrypted. And once it started gaining traction in Hong Kong and other places experiencing protests, the developers also began promoting it for this use case. Now, an actual internet shutdown um, never materialized in Hong Kong, but mobile networks did get congested, which could have also contributed to the app's downloads. However, Hong Kong's role was to serve as inspiration for protesters in many other countries, and indeed in vastly different contexts. BridgeFi started appearing as part of Hong Kong tactics that were being adopted elsewhere. Now, just to name a few, this included the Citizenship Amendment Act protests in India that happened during December 2019, when the government mandated internet shutdowns actually did take place. It was being promoted during the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter protests in the US, and then also fear of a government shutdown during protests in Zimbabwe urged protesters to install BridgeFi. During the presidential election in Belarus and the days of protests that followed, internet was partially blocked, which again led some protesters to BridgeFi. And the last example I will mention is Thailand, that moved to block certain independent media and also the messaging application Telegram. Of course, um, judging adoption on the ground purely by press reports and social media posts, one could get an overblown picture of its actual use, especially since for the mesh to work as advertised, the app requires a certain critical number of users. However, there is sufficient evidence to suggest that Whenever there was a new flare-up of protest activity or a government move to limit internet access, people downloaded and tried to use BridgeFi in response. So we took an interest and uh, decided to investigate how secure this app was in reality. Since the source code was not available, we reverse engineered the Android app. And in short, we focused on the case when internet is unavailable and so Bluetooth is used. The mesh that is composed of all devices with BridgeFi installed is just a managed flood-based network, which uses time to live counters that decrease on every hop and receipts that indicate that a mesh message has reached its destination. And so the messages that are sent on this nest network are first compressed with gzip and then encrypted block by block using RSA with the now deprecated PKCS1 version 1.5 padding standard. And without access to internet, all devices that come into Bluetooth range of each other automatically perform a handshake during which they exchange their public keys. We discovered a number of vulnerabilities stemming from this setup. So to summarize, First, an attacker with a physical presence can easily track BridgeFi users and reveal their social graphs just by passively observing the network. The handshake was not cryptograph cryptographically authenticated and it on instead only relied on user IDs and Bluetooth addresses to establish identity. And as a result, there was nothing stopping an attacker from impersonating any user and also from performing a full attacker in the middle between any 
in Bluetooth range of each other. Further, while the use of PKCA's one version 1.5 didn't immediately provide a padding oracle, um, one could still be built thanks to the composition with gzip compression. And so a new variant of Blackenbacher's attack could be instantiated that could decrypt a message using on average two to the 17 chosen ciphertexts. Finally, it was possible to perform denial of service on the network by using a zip bomb, which is just a small file that decompresses to a very large payload. We verified all of these attacks in practice on Android devices using Frida, which is a dynamic instrumentation toolkit that allows injecting scripts into running processes in an essentially black box manner. Um, I will now go through a short timeline of the disclosure process with Bridgefy, the company. We first contacted them privately in April 2020, initially offering the standard 90 days before public disclosure, but after some back and forth, this was moved to August. However, before the agreed date, the company started partially informing its users about the existing issues in a somewhat non-standard manner. So they first tweeted that they removed encryption from the app, which was not actually the case, but they said this was their attempt to explain to users in a simpler way that there are issues with the encryption without having to say precisely what went wrong. And further, they announced that they were redoing their protocol from scratch. The app or its description on the app store, however, did not mention the issues and the app continued to be promoted in protest contexts. Then by the agreed date in August, it wasn't clear what the timeline for the new protocols would be. We considered moving the disclosure date forward, but there was no assurance that this wouldn't happen again. And so given these partial disclosures, we decided to disclose as planned. We released an abridged version of our paper that came out alongside a media article informing about the dangers of using the app as it is without giving details of their implemented architecture. And Bridgefire also published a statement of their own confirming the issues. Finally, at the end of October, the app was updated, supposedly integrating the signal protocol. However, we have not reviewed these changes and so we cannot comment on whether the implementation is actually adequate. And we have also recommended to Bridgefy that they employ an independent audit if they can. I would like to end with a couple of thoughts. Um, first of all, you would be right to note that there was nothing particularly surprising about the attacks we found, since once the specification was extracted from the reverse engineered implementation, it was kind of clear where it was going to go. And one reason for this is of course that the app was not intended for the protest setting. However, we are on thin ground here. Once this trend picked up, even the developers of Bridgefire didn't shy away from explicitly promoting it as a protest app. And therefore we would like to raise two open questions for security researchers. First, what security can even be achieved in the mesh setting in the first place? There is a lot of common ground with messaging protocols in general. However, there are particular features of this setting, which mean we may need to re-examine the security notions that are deemed ideal. Second, bringing back the focus to the users of these apps, what security needs do protesters in these settings actually have? We have somewhat glided over this in our analysis imagining scenarios and assuming that certain basic properties are shared among many users, regardless of whether they participate in a protest and whether that it's in Hong Kong or one of the many other countries where Bridge Vice saw a rise in adoption. Um, and these included a vast range of regi regimes and therefore potential threat models. So more fundamental research into this question is needed so that designers can avoid creating solutions which do not actually fit their users' needs. Finally, applications and subjects such as this are usually not the easiest to find, but nonetheless, there are a couple of lessons that can be learned from our work. And even though this happens time and time again, 
it seems that developers are still turning to old deprecated standards and therefore compromising the security of their products. Further, our work emphasizes that there is a need for applications to be evaluated under the conditions they are actually used in, even if their designers may not have imagined such use cases when they began. And the fact that protesters turned to BridgeFi when it was targeting an entirely different population also makes it clear that the mesh messaging space is lacking alternative solutions, especially when it comes to mobile mesh networking, meaning without the need for any additional hardware. Now, Briar gets mentioned in these contexts sometimes, but this is an app which only allows direct connections without relaying private messages in the mesh, so it can't really be considered to be in the same category. So with this work, we would also like to highlight the existing gap for technology designers. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Karin Klein. I'm a PhD student at ISD Austria, and today I will talk about invisible attacks in automated contact tracing. Contact tracing is a very important tool to prevent contagious diseases such as COVID-19 from uncontrolled spreading. Whenever a party is diagnosed sick, all parties that have been in their vicinity during the contagious period should immediately be warned so that they can isolate already before they get contagious themselves. Since manual contact tracing soon reaches its limits when many people are affected and furthermore only identifies contacts the diagnosed party knows, an automated solution can be very helpful. There are many projects developing such automated tools leveraging the fact that many people carry around mobile phones most of the time. Most of these approaches are based on low energy Bluetooth. Major projects include East and West Coast Pact, COVID Watch, TP3T, Robert and its successor Desire, and PepPT. Google and Apple jointly developed the so-called Google Apple Exposure Notification System, short gain, which is widely employed, especially in Europe, and is similar to the TP3T protocol. Clearly, the goal is to construct simple and efficient schemes that can be implemented timely and at the same time provide strong security and privacy guarantees. Typically in such contact tracing schemes, users broadcast messages using Bluetooth so that only users in their close proximity can receive and process them. When diagnosed, they get permission to upload a report message to the backend server. These report messages together with the local state of a user then allows to evaluate whether the user is at risk. Here one differentiates between centralized and decentralized approaches. In centralized schemes, the risk evaluation is done by the server, whereas in decentralized schemes, it is done locally on a user's phone. In our work, we are concerned about the important security aspect of preventing false positives. Whilst, while false positives cannot be prevented completely, we are worried about attacks that can be launched on a large scale. Such large-scale attacks triggering false positives might not only affect deployment of the app, but also influence external events, such as elections. One type of such attacks are replay attacks, where an adversary broadcasts messages it previously received from other users. A first interactive solution to prevent replay attacks was proposed by Serge Vaudenay. Later schemes like Pronto C2 and Desire prevent replay attacks by non-interactive exchange. Both these approaches are privacy-preserving, however slightly loose in efficiency and simplicity. Google and Apple, on the other hand, decided for a non-interactive solution where they store and authenticate the epoch of each encounter, which clearly implies a loss of privacy. A unidirectional and privacy-preserving solution to prevent replay attacks is delayed authentication, which was proposed by Krzysztof Pietrzak at Indocrypt 2020. Even if replay attacks can be prevented, relay attacks might still be possible where an adversary sends messages it received to another device far away in real time to be replayed there. To the best of our knowledge, all schemes preventing relay attacks require location-dependent values like GPS coordinates or cell tower IDs. There is another class of attacks that has not gained much attention so far, which we call inverse civil attacks. While in replay and relay attacks, adversaries repeat messages they received, inverse civil attacks are of a different flavor and will be the topic of this talk. We call that in a so-called civil attack, one party pretends to be many different parties. In an inverse civil attack, in contrast, many devices pretend to be just one user, so that in case one of them gets diagnosed positive, 
all users that were in contact with any of the malicious users will be alerted. This attack was previously discussed by Serge Woudney, who called it a terrorist attack. We will now discuss an invisible attack on the example of the widely employed GAIN scheme. First, let's recall the high-level structure of this protocol. In the GAIN scheme, each user holds some private key, which is regularly rotated and is used to derive ephemeral IDs to be broadcasted. Users receiving such random B can store them in the list. When a user gets diagnosed positive, it receives an upload token and sends its key from the last two weeks in permuted order together with the token to the backend server, which stores them in the list. All users regularly download this updated list and check whether one of the keys matches an entry in their own local list of encounters. If this is indeed the case, they receive a warning. Unfortunately, inversible attacks can easily be launched on the game scheme as follows. The blue owls represent malicious users or honest users whose phones got hacked. And we assume all these users set up their devices using the same keys K. They will then use these keys to derive ephemeral IDs, which they broadcast to users in their proximity, represented by the owls on the right. When later one of the blue owls gets diagnosed positive, it will upload the common keys from which the green owls represent, uh, derive all the random beacons that were previously broadcasted by any of the blue owls. Thus, all green owls will receive an alert that be sent to quarantine, while in fact only the third one indeed had a positive contact. Note that this attack exploits the fact that the family IDs are derived deterministically. Inversible attacks can also be launched on other schemes, including protocols using non-interactive exchange, such as Desai or Pronto C2. However, in decentralized protocols, such as Robert or Desire, where risk evaluation is done by the server, inversible attacks do not scale that dramatically because the server sees the total number of encounters and can simply cap this number. In our work, we propose two protocols that to the best of our knowledge are the first that do not succumb to inversible attacks. Our approach to prevent inversible attacks is to derive random beacons from a hash chain. To enforce that hash chains of different users divert, we include some external randomness. This could either be random values that are exchanged with other users at each encounter or some location-based coordinate. So if two users are set up maliciously and use the same initialization, their hash chains will only coincide in the first block. And by collision resistance of the hash function, there is no chance for the adversary to later combine these chains to a single hash chain that can be uploaded to the server. Thus, only one of them can ultimately upload their hash chain. Here we make the assumption that devices cannot communicate since otherwise an inversible attack seems hard to avoid without giving up on privacy or making very strong additional assumptions. For our constructions, to execute inversible attacks on a large scale, devices would need to constantly communicate. Efficiency-wise, our approach is comparable to gain, but requires larger download cost. Furthermore, we require non-interactive exchange or some form of location data. Concerning privacy, we put a little more trust on the server since it inherently learns some ordering of the uploaded random values. Finally, let us note that this approach can be used to design centralized as well as decentralized schemes. I'll now give a brief overview of our two protocols. The first scheme is based on non-interactive exchange. Users progress some hash chain and store two lists, one for risk evaluation, the other one to upload to the server in case they should get diagnosed positive. In regular intervals, they sample a random string and broadcast it together with the tip of their hash chain. If they receive another user's message, they store the received hash together with their own random string in the evaluation list and their own hash together with the received random string in the report list. Then they progress the hash chain infusing the received random string. If a party gets sick, it uploads its report list to the server, which checks whether the uploaded values indeed form a hash chain. To evaluate the risk status, parties regularly download the list from the server and check whether their evaluation list contains a list from the server's list. This toy protocol provides a minimal solution to prevent invasive attacks. However, it has some correctness and privacy issues. 
which we solved in our final protocols. First, to allow for parallel encounters, our scheme advances in epochs, collecting received random strings in a pool of messages that is later used to extend the hash chain. Concerning privacy, to avoid that receiving users can reconstruct hash chains and learn the number of encounters a diagnosed user had, use keyed hash functions, and let the server permute the list of hash values. Clearly, this does not improve privacy against a malicious server, since the server requires the key to check that uploaded values indeed from a hash chain. Finally, to avoid that the server can learn whether two hash chains had a common encounter, we use unique chaining values. Namely, instead of S, we use a hash containing S and the two tips of the hash chains. To summarize, our first protocol is rather efficient. However, the up and down loads are linear in the number of encounters. Furthermore, it requires non-interactive exchange. Since users broadcast unlinkable to the random weekends, privacy on the user side is as good as for the unlinkable game protocol, but we put more trust on the server, which learns an ordering of the weekends. In our second protocol, instead of random strings exchanged during encounters, the chaining values are derived from some location-dependent data. This could be course GPS location, cell tower IDs, or information from IP addresses. Also in this scheme, users send and receive pseudo random beacons. But again, we have to put slightly more trust in the server, which can link these beacons. Security against invisible attacks only holds under the assumption that the locations of the encounters are unpredictable. We believe that whenever the location coordinates are chosen not too coarse, this still implies meaningful security. The advantage of this scheme is that it also provides security against relay attacks. To summarize our results, we provide the first formal models of inversible attacks and propose two different privacy-preserving schemes that do not succumb to such attacks. Both schemes are based on hash chains. The first one relies on non-interactive exchange, the second on some location-based coordinate, where the location data is, of course, not stored. While both our schemes are decentralized, it is straightforward to adapt them to the centralized setting. For more details, we refer to our paper. Thanks for your attention. I hope to see many of you at the discussion later. So welcome to my presentation. I'm Serge Vaudonnet from EPFL, and I'm going to present you some joint work with Vincenzo Iovino and Martin Vuagnou. This presentation will be on uh, decentralized contact tracing, uh, and I will uh, explain you uh, the uh, architecture. So the architecture uh, works like this. So you have uh, people wearing smartphones, and those smartphones are sending random numbers. These random numbers are ch changing frequently. So these random numbers are visible by their uh, neighbors. So everyone is keeping a list of all the numbers that they have sent and all the numbers that they have received from their neighbors. And the idea is that if someone gets sick, this person will receive some uh, access code, which will give the privilege to be able to post on a public bulletin board all the uh, random numbers which have been sent in the recent past together with their, uh, the time when they have been sent. So that everybody will be able to check on the public bulletin board uh, the numbers which have been sent and belonging to someone who was uh, uh, diagnosed. And uh, people will be able to compare these numbers with all the numbers they have received. And if there is any match, there will be an alert. And in the case of an alert, this person is supposed to uh, go to quarantine or to get a test. But in any case, it is uh, supposed to be a stressful situation. So now this stressful situation can be used uh, by adversaries. Uh, the idea is that we will have adversaries trying to inject some false alerts on the smartphone of their victim to put them under stress. We'll consider the attack model uh, where, for instance, a lazy student would like to have a course or an exam canceled. Uh, for this, he would inject some false alert on his teachers or classmates. Uh, this can be also the same situation for someone who wants to uh, inject a false alert uh, to his competitors in any kind of competition so that his competitor will be put under stress and the adversary will have some advantage in the competition. 
We can imagine some kind of terrorism where someone would like to massively spread some false alerts uh, in, uh, in a population uh, to cause some disruption. And we can also imagine someone who wants to self-inject a false alert on himself just to have a good excuse to escape from some uh, boring events such as, uh, for instance, uh, dinner at the in-laws. So how to inject some uh, uh, false uh, alerts? Uh, first, we consider an attack that we call keep it stupid simple because that's a uh, uh, design uh, paradigm of the decentralized contact tracing system, keep it stupid simple. Uh, so we first consider this keep it stupid simple attack where an adversary is just waiting until someone posts uh, a random number on a public built-in board uh, and check if the time where this number was sent makes it still valid at the present time. If it is the case, then this adversary can just replace this random number and wait until his victim will check on the bulletin board because it will raise an alert. So this attack is really simple. It's uh, so stupid that we, we have some hard time to imagine that this attack is even possible. So for that, we had to check and we check on uh, the public bulletin board of many regions. And here we, we drew a map of all the regions. So all the colored regions are the regions which use the decentralized contact tracing system by Apple and Google. And uh, so the countries, the regions which are in, uh, in gray are the regions that we didn't test and all, all other we tested them. Regions which are in red are those regions in which this KISS attack is possible. So for instance, in Italy, in Austria, in the Netherlands, in Latvia. We have seen uh, when we did our, our test, so it was our test was in the uh, last two weeks. In the last two weeks, we have seen that sometimes a, a random number is posted and this random number is still active, it's still valid. We can replay it and it injects some false alerts. So in those, those red, red countries, we can have such attack. In the orange countries, the situation is a bit different because these countries sometimes copies the uh, random numbers which have been posted on the built on board of the red countries. So if you're, for instance, in Germany, and you can see on the uh, public built-in board of the Netherlands that there is a key which is posted and still valid, you can still try to uh, replay it to all your neighbors in Germany. And maybe in a few hours, these random numbers will be copied on the German uh, built-in board and it will raise an alert on your neighbors. So the attack is still valid on all those orange, orange regions. In the green regions, uh, we didn't see uh, any such uh, uh, case uh, during the two weeks during which we did this test. So if you're in a green country and this uh, attack is uh, not working or is uh, so rare that uh, it's not useful for the adversary, you may still want to inject some false alerts. And for that, we will use another technique. We will use actually a time machine. Remember this old movie, Back to the Future, in 1985, where someone invented a time machine and he set as a golden rule never to set it to 2020. At this time, we didn't know why, but now I can tell you the uh, reason. The reason is that uh, because of a uh, time machine, we can ha uh, inject some false alerts uh, very easily. So how does it work? Imagine that you have an adversary who can make his victim travel through time. So this adversary is waiting until a random number is posted on the built-in board. This random number comes with a time uh, of validity. Then this adversary will make his victim travel to this time of validity. He will replace the number and then he will wait until his victim come ba comes back to the present time, checks the built-in board and gets an alert. So the attack is simple. We just need a time machine. So far, we didn't succeed to make people travel through time. But for smartphones, it's quite easy because the smartphones are, uh, are not so smart, actually. If we tell them that we are, say, in uh, 2020 or in 2030, they will believe it. So we can just uh, tell them what is the date, and the smartphone will believe it.
So we, we made three kinds of uh, time machines to make uh, smartphones travel through time. So the easiest one is when we have some physical access to the smartphone of the victim, we can just set the clock manually or using a malware. But if we are not in this situation, we can uh, still assume that the smartphone of the victim and the smartphone and the equipment of the adversary are connected to the same Wi-Fi network. If it is the case, then the adversary can do some app spoofing on the Wi-Fi network and redirect all the NTP requests by the smartphone. This NTP communication will intercept uh, the request to the clock and we will just be able to tell uh, the smartphone what time it is and what date it is and uh, decide uh, about it. It works if there is no priority to set the, to set the date, which is based on, uh, on, a, uh, on a network, on a communication network. If there is a priority on a communication network, what we can do is to make a rock base station. So this is the equipment to make a rock base station. Uh, we did it and it works very well. We tested it in a Faraday cage and we can uh, set the clock of a smartphone at a distance uh, this way. It works very well. So like this, we can do uh, our uh, master of time attack. The idea is that once we get a key on a public built-on board and a time of validity, we make the victim jump to this time, and then we replay uh, this key uh, during a few milliseconds. Uh, this key will be captured by the smartphone and it will count like a five minutes encounter. Then we make another time jump by five minutes ahead. It will trigger another Bluetooth scan and it will count for another five minutes. We make an additional time jump of five minutes ahead. And like this, the smartphone will believe that he has met someone during 15 minutes. Although the attack took only one second, we make the smartphone believe that we have encountered during 15 minutes and we can do it over uh, a quite large uh, uh, region uh, with, uh, with a small equipment. So like this, the attack works and it works uh, uh, very easily and it's very fast and uh, quite discreet. We can also use this uh, technique to defeat the privacy protection, which is in a decentralized contact tracing. Uh, with, uh, to, to defeat the privacy, we can, for instance, right now recognize if one of the smartphones that we can uh, see, because it's sending some random numbers, we can uh, check if this smartphone is the same as the smartphones that we have seen yesterday. Yesterday, we have seen a smartphone, he sent some random numbers, and to check if the smartphones that we see right now is the same, we can make this smartphone travel back to yesterday and replay a number. If the number is the same, we can deduce that the smartphone was the same. We can recognize smartphones that we have seen in the past. We can anticipate a recognition in the future, and we can also de-anonymize any uh, smartphone by making it uh, jump to some reference date like the 1st of January 2030. And like this, every smartphone will always replay the same number in the 1st of January 2030. And we can recognize a uh, smartphone this way by a unique number. This is a way to de-anonymize smartphone. We essentially ask them, who are you? And they reply by the same number. So this attack, we have uh, uh, documented it uh, uh, last year and we have reported it. And the typical reaction that we have seen is uh, like this. So people who deploy this infrastructure consider that the risk is acceptable and essentially they will not uh, implement any protection against this. Uh, to defeat this type of attack, uh, what we can say is that we can try to mandate the use of a secure clock by the operating system. But I think it will take uh, several years uh, until we have a secure clock in operating systems. Uh, we can also try in a decentralized contact tracing app uh, to check that the time is only increasing. But if we do so, we will also open the way to some denial of services attack, which is not uh, always a good idea. And uh, lastly, we can also try to have some more elaborate uh, um, a detection of clock manipulation, uh, which is a, a bit more complicated, but it's, uh, it's feasible. Uh, 
So that's uh, for the possible countermeasure. As a final conclusion, uh, what I can say is that uh, these decentralized contact tracing systems, which were proposed uh, more than one year ago, it was proposed with uh, uh, objective to have a very high security protection and very high privacy protection. But we can see that all those premises have been uh, broken. Uh, the security is not so good. The privacy protection is not so good. And, uh, and we believe that people have been deceived by this. Uh, I collected also many other observations uh, on this decentralized contact tracing system on this URL, and I invite you to, to check this. Thank you very much for your attention.